Every Christian knows about the internal battle between the flesh and the spirit. If you let the flesh take control of your heart, it will steal, kill, and destroy. But if you, by the spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh, you'll enjoy a life of victory. Hi, I'm Pastor Jeff Shreve. Thanks for joining us today as we continue our study of the eighth chapter of the book of Romans. Today, you'll learn how to understand God's plan for your life in a message called the flesh, the spirit, and the Christian. Today, I want to speak to you on a message I've entitled, The Flesh, the Spirit, and the Christian. Galatians chapter 5 says, For I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not carry out the desire of the flesh. For the flesh sets its desire against the Spirit, and the Spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another, so that you may not do the things that you please. The flesh and the spirit are in opposition. Years ago, I ran across a story about a missionary to Africa, and he led this man to faith in Christ, and then this new convert was working with the missionary, and one day the missionary found that the guy was stealing. And so he said to him, he said, hey, what are you doing? Why are you stealing? And the man said, oh, missionary, it was not I but it was grandfather in the bones. That's how he referred to his old nature, his flesh. It was grandfather in the bones. And so the missionary began to work with him and disciple this guy, and he began to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And sometime later, he asked this convert, he goes, hey, how is grandfather in the bones? He said, well, he's not gone, but he sure doesn't get around like he used to. <laughs> the flesh, the spirit, and the Christian. Every Christian knows about the battle that takes place inside. And when you think of Romans 6 and Romans 7 and Romans 8, Romans 6 tells us that we are dead to sin, but we're alive to God in Christ Jesus. And we're not under the law, we're under grace. And our old self, our old man, grandfather in the bones, has been crucified with Christ. Romans 7 tells us, and Paul is giving testimony, about the battle that takes place. I, I'm dead to sin, I'm alive to God, but man, there is something in me that's pushing me toward sin. He said, I find this principle then that evil is present in me, the one who wishes to do good. The good that I do, I don't do, and the evil that I don't want to do, I do. Wretched man that I am, who will set me free from the body of this death? So Romans 6 says you're dead to sin and alive to God. Romans 7 says, yeah, but there's a problem, and that problem is the flesh. And then Romans 8 tells us the answer to that problem is the Holy Spirit. Spirit of God. You know, the Holy Spirit is referred to in Romans chapter 8 17 times. In the whole book of Romans, the Holy Spirit is referenced 27 times. So, out of the 27 times referenced in the whole book of Romans, 16 chapters, 17 of those times is in chapter 8. It's life in the Spirit. Flesh is mentioned 13 times in chapter 8. And so we've entitled this message, The Flesh, the Spirit, and the Christian. And here's our question. Do you understand how the Christian life is designed to work? Because Jesus said, I came that you might have life and might have it abundantly, that it would be full and overflowing, and that we would walk in victory. This sermon series is titled More Than Conquerors from Romans 8, 37. But in all these things, we overwhelmingly conquer through him who loved us. 
So do you understand the Christian life and how it's designed to work? I want to share with you three key discoveries that will help you understand the Christian life and help you to rise above the power of the flesh and grandfather in the bones. Discovery number one, <clears throat> the Lord came to deliver us from the penalty of sin. He came to deliver us from the penalty of sin. He came in the flesh. Jesus Christ was God in the flesh. He came in the, li the likeness of sinful flesh. He himself was not a sinner, but he came in the likeness of sinful flesh. And as an offering for sin, he condemned sin in the flesh in order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. Now, 1 John chapter 2 says, My little children, I'm writing these things to you so that you may not sin. And if anyone sins, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous, and he himself is the propitiation for our sins, the satisfaction for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for those of the whole world. He died for the whole world. And his death becomes personal to you and is applied to your life when you put your faith and trust in Jesus. You know, Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior. But that's not the key question. Is Jesus the Lord and the Savior? Is Jesus your Lord and your Savior? Is it personal? So he came to deliver us from the penalty of sin. And we have been justified by faith in Jesus Christ. That's how you get delivered from the penalty of sin. You put your faith in tr and trust in Jesus Christ. Romans chapter 5, verse 1. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. And once you come to Christ in repentance of faith, the battle is over between you and God. There's no longer, longer enmity and, and distance between you and God. You have been, uh, you go from being a child of wrath to a child of God. And so we have this relationship now by grace through faith with the Lord Jesus Christ. And we've been set free from any and all condemnation. As it says, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. For the law of the Spirit of life, that's the Holy Spirit, the law of the Spirit of life in Christ Jesus has set you free from the law of sin and death. And when it says there's no condemnation, that is strong in the Greek. That means there's not a speck, there's not a shred. You know, when you get, uh, you have somebody who's a, a notorious criminal and he gets uh, before the judge and they start reading out the charges against this guy, it's not just one charge. It's typically many charges. You know, if you get pulled over and you're speeding and uh, you have a host of other things uh, wrong, the officer, he looks at your license. Oh, your license is expired. You were going uh, 85 and a 55. That's a speeding ticket. But your license is expired. That's another ticket. And your taillight's out. That's another ticket. And your, uh, your inspection is, uh, is past due. That's another ticket. You get all these tickets, and so you have to pay all these things. It starts adding up. Well, when the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, every single charge has been wiped away. There's not one skinny little transgression on a Christian's ledger. And this is how the Scripture puts it in Colossians chapter 2, verses 13 and 14. When you were dead in your transgressions and the uncircumcision of your flesh... He made you alive together with him, having forgiven us all our transgressions, having canceled out the certificate of debt consisting of decrees against us and which was hostile to us, and he has taken that out of the way, having nailed it to the cross. So all your sins nailed to the cross, and the law that condemned you nailed to the cross, and you have been set free in Jesus Christ, free from the penalty of sin. That is good news for sure. Now, the opposite of condemnation, Romans 5, 16, is justification. And justification is God wrapping his gravel and, gavel and saying, not guilty. 
You, it's just as if you've never sinned, and the not guilty goes on your permanent ledger, and when you stand before God, you stand before God not guilty. So the Lord came to deliver us from the penalty of sin. Now, when we talk in theological terms, that is the theological word justification. Justification, and that happens, boom, the moment you put your faith and trust in Jesus. Now, Secondly, the second key discovery, not only did the Lord come to deliver us from the penalty of sin, but the Lord came to deliver us from the power of sin. So penalty of sin is justification. Power of sin is sanctification. Justification happens in a moment in time. For me, it was January 1980 when I put my faith and trust in Jesus and I passed out of death into life and the death that Jesus died upon the cross and his burial and his resurrection that was applied to me and all my sins were nailed to the cross and God wrapped his gavel and says, Jeff Shreve, not guilty. And that was uh, on my permanent file. I'm not guilty for all of eternity. That happened when I was 17 years old. But, and that's justification. That's true for everyone. Therefore, having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That's not a process. You know, sometimes you ask a person, you say, well, are, are you a Christian? Well, kind of, I'm working toward that. Oh, well, what are you, some kind of larvae? I mean, it doesn't work like that. You're, you're not a caterpillar, right? Yeah, you're, you either are or you're not. You know, if you ask somebody, hey, are you pregnant? Well, I don't know kind of, a little bit. I mean, you either are or you're not. There's no kind of maybe a little bit. Justification happens, boom, like that. Sanctification, the second part of salvation. See, because we say, I have been saved. Past tense of salvation is justification, and that's true. But the Bible also speaks of the present tense of salvation. I'm in the process of being saved, and that is sanctification. The Lord came not only to deliver us from the penalty of sin, no condemnation, but he also came to deliver us from the power of sin. Verse 4 says, In order that the requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. So the Lord freed us from the law. We're not under the law anymore. We're under grace. But he didn't free us from the law so we could live lawlessly. He doesn't save us uh, for sin. He saves us from sin. So some people say, I'm saved so I can sin all I want. I have a, I have a get out of jail free card and I have my fire insurance and so I can just do whatever I want. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches that the moment you put your faith and trust in Christ, you are saved from sin and now he wants you to live out the Christian life under grace, but that the requirement of the law the righteousness of the law would be fulfilled in you, and you are now delivered not only from the penalty of sin, but from the power of sin. Now, you mark it down. The struggle in the Christian life is with the flesh. You struggle with the flesh. I struggle with the flesh. We struggle with the flesh. Paul struggled with the flesh. Grandfather in the bones. The, the, the part of you that's been crucified... But that doesn't mean it's gone. It's crucified, Romans 6, 6, which means it's rendered powerless, that the body of sin might be done away with, might be rendered powerless, doesn't have any more power over you. And a lost person only has the, the dominating power of the flesh, but a saved person has the power of the Holy Spirit from the Lord. So we ask the question, well, the Bible uses the word flesh a lot, sarx in the Greek. What is, what is the flesh? When the Bible talks about flesh, is it talking about my, my skin and my uh, hide and hair? Is it talking about my, my bones and my tissues? Is it talking about anatomy? No. It's talking about that old residual nature that you inherited from Adam. John MacArthur puts it this way, defining the flesh. He says, Scripture uses the term flesh in a morally evil sense to describe man's unredeemed humanness, that remnant of the old man which will remain with each believer until each receives his or her glorified body. See, 
Justification, I have been saved. Sanctification, the process of making me like Christ. The old song, he's still working on me to make me what I ought to be. Took him just a week to make the moon and the stars, the sun and the earth and Jupiter and Mars. How loving and patient he must be. He's still working on me. The Lord working on you is the sanctification process to make you like himself to make you like Jesus. You shall be holy for I am holy. Christ likeness doesn't happen like that. Justification happens like that. Sanctification happens over time as we become more and more and more like Jesus in the way we act and react. And then one day there is coming a new body for the believer. And uh, the Bible says in Philippians chapter 3, that uh, he's going to transform the body of our humble state into conformity with the body of his glory through the exertion of the power that he has even to subject all things to himself. So we're waiting for the day when this old flesh, grandfather in the bones, is gone, and we have a new body, and the new body wants to serve the Lord without any hesitation or reservation. But right now, we're not there. And so we're struggling with this thing called the flesh. An easy way to think about the flesh, think about it in computer terms. When you're born into this world, you have a corrupt operating system. Windows 8. We'll just say that. You know, uh, I did a little research. I'm not a super tech guy, but Windows 8 was like a bomb. And so, you're born with Windows 8. doesn't work very well. It's corrupt. It just can't get it right. And so, uh, your operating system is never going to work right. You're, you can work and work and work on your computer, and right when you're ready to print or send, it crashes, and you lose it all. I mean, it's just never right. It's a corrupted operating system. And so, you need a new operating system. Well, the new operating system comes from the Lord, comes from His Spirit. And the Bible goes on to say about the flesh and the Spirit in verses 5 through Eight, it pits the two because the flesh and the spirit have nothing in common. And Jesus said to Nicodemus, that which is of the flesh is flesh and that which is of the spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I say to you, Nicodemus, you must be born again. You must get a new operating system because your operating system is going to take you to hell. It's a corrupt operating system. Romans chapter 5, verse 8. For those who are according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh. But those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mindset on the flesh is death, but the mindset on the Spirit is life and peace. Because the mindset on the flesh is hostile toward God, and it does not subject itself to the law of God, for it is not even able to do so. And those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Impossible to please God in the flesh. Impossible with the old operating system to ever get it to work right. You can't tweak it. You can't uh, put in a patch. No, it just does not work. That which is of the flesh is flesh, and those who are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, Romans 5, 8, 5, Romans 8, 5 through 8, is speaking of and comparing a Christian in the Spirit versus a non-Christian according to the flesh. According to the Spirit is a Christian, according to the flesh is a non-Christian. How do you know that? Verse 9, however you are not in the flesh but in the Spirit, if indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you. But if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. So he's talking in the Spirit, according to the Spirit, Christian. In the flesh, according to the flesh, non-Christian. The, the Spirit is the new operating system. The flesh is the old operating system. And so, the flesh has nothing in common with the Spirit. Here's some things about the flesh. The flesh is alive physically and dead spiritually. That is the flesh. Because a, a lost person is alive physically but dead spiritually. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, And you were dead in your trespasses and sins, in which you formerly walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, according to the spirit that is now working in the sons of disobedience. And you were by nature children of wrath, even as the rest. Uh, you're alive, but you're dead spiritually. And that's what he is saying. Those who are according to the flesh... 
They set their minds on the things of the flesh. Those who are according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. For the mind set on the flesh is death. That old operating system, death. It's corrupt. And there's nothing you can do about it. But the mind set on the Spirit is life and peace. So the flesh is alive physically, but dead spiritually. 1 Timothy 5, 6. She who gives herself to wanton pleasure is dead even while she lives. But also... The flesh knows nothing of life and peace. The mindset on the flesh is death. The mindset on the spirit is life and peace. Flesh doesn't know anything about life and peace. That old operating system doesn't have anything to do with life and peace because it's just bent toward death and chaos. That's what you get with the flesh. And the Bible says, this is a, a great little witnessing tool when you're talking to somebody who might have a lot of things in this world, ask them this question. I, I heard Adrian Rogers say this one time when he was witnessing to somebody, and the guy had so much, and the guy didn't want to hear Adrian's witness. And Adrian said this, asked him this question. He said, sir, I want to ask you a question. And before I ask you the question, I want to, to get a commitment from you that you will answer me honestly. Will you answer me honestly? And the man said, yeah, if you ask me a question, I'll answer you honestly. He said, sir, do you have peace in your heart right now? And it stopped the guy dead in his tracks. And he said to Adrian, although he had a nice house and cars and a boat and beautiful wife and kids, he said, how did you know that I didn't have peace? He said, because the Scripture says, from the Lord, there is no peace, says my God, for the wicked. The, the mindset on the flesh doesn't experience life and peace. If you're according to the flesh, a non-Christian can't experience life and peace. It is impossible. Peace belongs to God, and God doesn't give it to those who are running the old operating system. You're never going to find it there. And thirdly, the flesh is hostile to God and unable to please God. Hostile to God. That old operating system fights with the new operating system. It doesn't like the new operating system. It's hostile to God. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. That's why there's no way for a lost person to make himself acceptable to God. It can't happen. Genesis chapter 4, Cain brought his offering before the Lord. It wasn't offered by faith. It wasn't what God told him to bring. God said, when you come before me, you come before me with a blood sacrifice. And we know that's true because Abel, by faith, offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than did his brother Cain. Abel brought a, a lamb. He brought the, the first of the flock and sacrificed it before the Lord. The Lord had regard for Abel and his offering, but for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. Why? Because Cain brought the fruit of the ground, the cursed ground. It grew uh, potatoes and fruit and turnips and peas and green beans, and he brings all that in a basket to the Lord. Well, what's the Lord looking for? He's looking for blood. And I don't care how hard you try, you just can't get blood out of a turnip. And so he has this, he's looking for blood, you can't get blood. And, and the Lord says, well, I don't want this. Why would you bring me this? I told you to bring a blood sacrifice, because without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness of sins. But Cain was coming his own way. He was coming with the old operating system. This is how I'm going to please God and win his favor. But for Cain and his offering, he had no regard. And Cain became very angry. And the Lord said to him, Cain, why are you so angry? And why is your countenance fallen? If you do well, will not your countenance be lifted up? But if you don't do well, sin is crouching at the door and its desire is for you. Yet you must master it. Cain never mastered it. He stayed in the flesh from an Old Testament perspective, stayed in the flesh while his brother Abel crossed over into the spirit. He got a new operating system in keeping with the illustration. Hey, the flesh has nothing in common with the spirit. And, and the theme song of the flesh, Frank Sinatra, I did it my way. 
That's the flesh. I think I've told you before, I've had some people over the years that uh, say for the funeral, oh, oh, uh, so-and-so, you know, my husband died, and he, he, was, a, he was just a do-it-yourselfer, and, and uh, so we need to play that song, I did it my way. I said, well, okay, you play that song. You're basically saying that my husband went to hell. Because if you do life your way, there is a way, Proverbs 14, 12, and 1625, that's a two for memorization because the same verse. There is a way that seems right to a man, but its end is the way of death. And if he did it his way and not the Lord's way, then he died and went to hell. Do you really want to communicate that at the funeral? I mean, it may be true, but let's, let's not broadcast that, uh, you know. I mean, I, I've done funerals for people that I didn't think were Christians. And I, I always just say, this person has crossed over into eternity. And if they put their faith and trust in Jesus, they're in heaven. And if they didn't, they're not. I don't know. So, you know, you leave it at that. But I'm never going to preach someone into heaven when I don't think they're there. Because that's not being honest with the people. I, I, Debbie and I went to a funeral for her uncle. He'd been married and divorced seven times. And the guy gets up and he starts talking about this, this wonderful man and this and that. I said, Debbie, I think we're at the wrong funeral. I mean... <laughs> I knew your uncle. You knew your uncle. I mean, he's, he, he wasn't Charles Manson, but, I mean, he's not, he's not the Apostle Paul. Let's quit acting like this person is someone other than he is. I digress. Anyway, <laughs> so the flesh has nothing in common with the Spirit. They're totally poles apart. And true Christians, as I mentioned, they're according to the Spirit. They're not according to the flesh. God doesn't look at us as being according to the flesh as believers in Jesus. We've been set free from that. And that's why he says in verse 9, however, you are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. If indeed the Spirit of God dwells in you, but if anyone does not have the Spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. What's the, what's the telltale uh, mark that you are a believer? The Holy Spirit lives inside of you. The Holy Spirit lives inside of every believer. In him you also, after listening to the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation, having also believed, you were sealed in him with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is given as a pledge of our inheritance with a view to the redemption of God's own possession to the praise of his glory, Ephesians 1, 13 and 14. Hey, when you trust Christ, the Lord, you have a new operating system. Now, the old operating system is still on the computer, but you're not running that. You're running the new operating system, and the old operating system is all the time trying to get you back into the programs it has. That's the battle between the flesh and the spirit. So the Lord came to deliver us from the power of sin, and key discovery number three, Victory in the Christian life comes through the Holy Spirit. That's how we overcome, is through the Holy Spirit. It's not by might, not by power, but by my Spirit, says the Lord. Here's what many of us try and do. We become Christians. We put our faith and trust in Jesus. And then we think, okay, now we have to gut out the Christian life. We have to grit our teeth with the Christian life. We have to just try harder. I just got to try harder. I got to try not to drink and try not to cuss and try not to do this and try not to do that. Try not to be bitter. Try not to lust. And we try, try, try so hard. And we fall into the ditch of legalism. You know, in the Christian life, you have the highway of walking with God and on one side of the road is the ditch of legalism. On the other side of the road is the ditch of license. Legalism sets up a bunch of rules. License says you can do whatever you want. Both of them, you end up in the ditch. That's not, we walk in the light as he himself is in the light. And so victory comes through the Holy Spirit. Now, Paul wrote a whole letter, the letter to the Galatians. Because the Galatians had put their faith and trust in Jesus, but then some Judaizers came in after Paul, the false teachers who tried to tell them, yeah, but you need to get circumcised and you need to follow the law of Moses and you can't be a Christian unless you're circumcised and you can't be a Christian unless you follow the law of Moses. Hey, we've been set free from the law. We're not under the law. We're under grace. And so Paul asked this question. He said, this is the one thing I want to know about you, Galatians. 
Did you receive the Spirit by the works of the law or by hearing with faith? Obviously, their answer was, yeah, hearing with faith. We didn't do it by the works of the law. He said, are you so foolish? Having begun in the Spirit, are you now being perfected in the flesh? The flesh and the Spirit have nothing in common. We begin in the Spirit and we continue in the Spirit. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that saves us. It's the power of the Holy Spirit that gives us victory in the battle. Victory in the Christian life comes through the Holy Spirit. You can't defeat the flesh with the flesh. You can't say, well, you know, I got this corrupt operating system, but hey, I have this other program on the corrupt operating system that'll help me with the corrupt operating system. The flesh, no, it doesn't work like that. The flesh can't defeat the flesh. And if you do bad in the flesh, well, that's the corrupt operating system. If you do good in the flesh, you know, there are a lot of people in church work that do good in the flesh. The Pharisees were Nicodemus, John chapter 3. What was he doing? He was trying to do good in the corrupt operating system. That's why Jesus said, uh, unless you're born again, unless you get a new operating system, you can't see the kingdom of, of heaven. You can't see the kingdom of God. And you're not going to enter the kingdom of God. You must be born again. And so this is what Paul goes on to say in verse 9 or verse 10. And if Christ is in you, though the body is dead because of sin, yet the spirit is alive because of righteousness. But if the spirit of him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who also raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. So then, brethren, we are under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. Such a key passage of Scripture. Victory comes through the Holy Spirit. Now, remember this, so important, because the devil is a liar and the father of lies, and he is all the time working so that we believe uh, this lie that we don't have power. But the Scripture makes it clear we have power in the Lord, and there is resurrection power living inside of every Christian. If the Spirit of Him who raised Jesus from the dead dwells in you, He who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will give life to your mortal bodies through His Spirit who indwells you. Think about this. The greatest challenge, if we could use those terms to talk about the Lord. The greatest challenge the Lord ever faced was when his son died on the cross, and he is in the tomb, and he is dead. And so, the, it's the Holy Spirit of God who gives life to Jesus, raises him up from the dead. Well, that's a serious problem when you're dead, right? I mean, you can say, well, I, I have problems, Jeff. I, I, you know, I have problems with substance abuse. I have problems with lying. I have problems with bitterness. I have problems with insecurity. I have problems with lust. I have problems with gambling. I have problems with drinking, uh, whatever it is. Oh, it's such a big problem. I just can't seem to get victory over this. Well, we'd all have to agree, whatever your problem is, it's not as big a problem as being dead and needing to come back to life. And that's a serious, serious problem. There's nothing greater than that. And if the spirit of him who raised Christ Jesus from the dead dwells in you, he who raised Christ Jesus from the dead will also give life to your mortal bodies through his spirit who indwells you. There is tremendous power inside of every Christian because the Holy Spirit is the third person of the Trinity, and he lives inside. Do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and that you're not your own? For you've been bought with a price, therefore glorify God in your bodies. In Ephesians 3, Paul prays that great prayer, and he closes it out and says this, Now to him who is able to do exceeding abundantly beyond all we ask or think, according to the power that works within us, to him be the glory. There is power inside of you and me as a believer in Jesus. Not our power. It's his power that mightily works within us. 
So we need to remember that. Hey, I I have power to overcome whatever I face in life because I'm not according to the flesh. I have a brand new operating system. I'm according to the Spirit, and I can walk in victory. So we are under our obligation, it says, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. I don't have any obligation to the old operating system. I have an obligation to the new operating system. We're under obligation not to the flesh to live according to the flesh, for if you are living according to the flesh, you must die. But if by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. That's the Christian life in a nutshell. What do we do when we come to Christ? Then we grow, and we're in this sanctification process. And how do we have victory in the sanctification process? By the Spirit, we put to death the deeds of the body so that we can live. And we bring those things, the grandfather in the bones, those areas where we're struggling, we bring those before the Lord, and we say, Lord, I need need your power in this area. So let me just use myself as an example. I come to Christ when I'm 17 years old. Well, my life is just full of sin, and I drink with my buddies, and I get drunk, and I act an idiot and uh, chase girls, and my mind is filled with lust and all sorts of uh, things like that. And so uh, that song, I live, I live, I live for the weekend, that was like, yeah, that's how I live. And I, you know, I think I'm a pretty good guy, and then I realized I'm not a good guy, and if I died, I wouldn't go to heaven, I'd go to hell. I gave my life to Christ. I was saved. I was justified. And the Lord Uh, wrote on my ledger, not guilty, paid in full by the blood of Jesus Christ. And then I entered into this sanctification process, and the Lord began to convict me of things. It's like, Jeff, we need to do something about your drinking. I wasn't an alcoholic. I was 17 years old. I wasn't an alcoholic, but I like to go out with my buddies and get drunk. And so he's like, you can't do that anymore. Well, why not, Lord? That seemed like a fun thing to do. You can't do that anymore. You belong to me. I want to use you as a witness to your friends. So you're going to have to quit doing that. All right? So we fought that battle. I laid aside the drinking. I'm not going to drink anymore. I hadn't had a drink in months. That's like a thousand months or something like that. It's been a long time since I've had a drink uh, because I just said I'm not going to do that anymore, and that, that chain was broken. And so then the Lord says, well, now let's deal with your filthy mouth, the things that come out of your mouth. And so I had to work through those things. So, you know, the people that uh, cuss and then they say, well, excuse my French. That's not French, right? (laughs) Not French. And the Lord hears that. And so let no unwholesome thing proceed from your mouth, but only such a word as is good for edification, according to the need of the moment, that it may give grace to those who hear. So we had to work on that. And taking God's name in vain, that had to leave my vocabulary and saying vulgarities, that had to leave. And so we worked on that, and we got victory in that. Sunday morning, sleeping in. No, 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 we're going to be in church on Sunday morning. Okay, we got victory in that. And then the Lord said to me, Okay, now let's talk about your problem with your mind. Let's talk about lust. I said, oh, Lord, can we talk about something else? Let's go back to the drinking thing. I'm doing really good on that. (laughs) No. And see, it's pictured in the Old Testament, the book of Judges. You know, Joshua is the book of conquest. They come take the promised land. Then Judges, they're starting to just work through the cities. And it says that they're doing really well in chapter 1. They're subduing this, uh, these people in this territory and that. And then it says that they took the hill country, but they couldn't take the valley because the Canaanites in the valley had iron chariots. And they said, we can't go up against iron chariots. And I said in so many words to the Lord, Lord, this thing of lust and this Problems with what's going on in my mind, that's an iron chariot. I I can't seem to defeat the iron chariot. And the Lord said, yeah, we're going to go after that. We're going to take that ground. And I'm going to teach you how to take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. And, you know, we face iron chariot sins. Not everything, you know, sometimes when you start out, those certain things can fall off pretty quickly. Hey, I'm not going to walk under that, uh, that dominion of sin. But you hit those, those pockets. Maybe it's bitterness, and the Lord convicts you about that. And you're like, oh, I'm, I'm bitter toward my dad or this person or that person. I, I'm having a hard time letting that 
go. That's an iron chariot sin. Insecurity can be an iron chariot sin. Lust for so many iron chariot sin. What do we do? If by the Spirit you are putting to death the deeds of the body, you will live. You ask the Lord, you bring him in and say, Lord, here is my Canaanite with his iron chariot, and I need your help. The Bible says in Romans 13, 14, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh with regard to its lusts. Listen, my friend Bob Lapine taught me this some years ago. He said, this is what we like to do in the Christian life. We want to manage the flesh. And God says, you mortify the flesh. You put it to death. We have to deal ruthlessly with the flesh. You don't play around with the flesh. The flesh is not your friend. The flesh is wanting to steal, kill, and destroy you. And so you have to put the deeds of the flesh, by the power of the Spirit, you put them to death. And here's the problem that we have. You know, the Bible says that we're dead to sin. We're alive to God. That's truth. We are dead to sin. But then it says to consider yourselves dead to sin. You say, why does it tell us that we're dead to sin and then we consider ourselves dead to sin? Because in truth you're dead to sin, but in your feelings you're not dead to sin. Would anybody say that that's my uh, testimony? I don't feel very dead to sin. Sin sure seems to have an appeal to me. I mean, uh, you know, sin is the kindling ground for the devil uh, to start a fire. And, and your flesh, it's still there. It hasn't gone away. The operating system of the flesh is still on the computer. You're just not on, running on that. But it's popping up things all the time, just like it did for Caleb. Want to see, want to see, want to go this way, want to do this. And there's a part of you that says yes. But then there's the spirit saying no, no. The flesh sets its desire against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. For these are in opposition to one another so that you may not do the things that you please. Here's what the Scripture says, Romans 6, and I'll close. Therefore, do not let sin reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lust, and do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Your members, that's your body. As righteousness to God, for sin shall not be master over you, for you are not under law, but under grace. Hey, there's victory in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the Spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit who lives inside. But we have to get ruthless with the flesh. And the last blank on your notes, if you don't put the flesh to death, the flesh will destroy you. It is no respecter of persons. And the devil will work on the flesh, and you let the flesh take control, and it will steal and kill and destroy. But if you, by the Spirit, put to death the deeds of the flesh, you will live, and you'll live in victory. And we're more than conquerors in Jesus Christ. As we close out today, I want to ask you, do you know for certain that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. Listen, if you're not sure about that, just pray this simple prayer with me. Lord Jesus, I need you. I know that I'm a sinner and I'm lost and I can't save myself. But Jesus, I believe you're a God in the flesh. I believe you died on the cross for my sins and rose again from the dead. And right now, Jesus, I open my heart to you. Forgive me of all my sins. Come into my life. Be my Lord and Savior. I surrender my all to you. And I promise to follow you all the days of my life. My friend, if you'll pray that kind of prayer and mean it, the Lord will come in and your life will never be the same. Hey, I'd love to hear from you, to know that you're watching, to know that God is making a difference in your life through this broadcast, to know that you just prayed that prayer. Please contact us. Let us know what's going on. We want to pray for you. We want to help you. You are important to God, and you're important to us, and we're here for you.